One of the interesting stories about the energy transition this year was that for the first time in a decade, battery prices have actually risen a bit. So I'm going to talk to Evelina Stoiku, who is an energy storage associate at Bloomberg NEF, about where battery prices are headed in the next little while. So welcome to the interview, Evelina. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm always uh, interested in talking to the Bloomberg NEF analysts because you folks, in my experience, do the most comprehensive uh, and and usually most accurate take on these sorts of stories. So can you give us uh, kind of an overview of where battery prices have gone in, in the last year or so and where you see them going in the next few years? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bloomberg and EF has been doing the survey for over 10 years, since 2010. And in this year, in 2022, we actually saw the first battery price increase at the pack level. Uh, battery pack prices were at $151 per kilowatt hour, which is about a 7% increase in real terms compared to last year. The first increase, as I said, that we've been uh, seeing since we've been tracking the market. Um, the main reason that this happened is higher commodity prices across the board, so higher prices for lithium, nickel, and cobalt, the battery metals that are key in battery cells um, and make up most of the, the cost of a cell. Um, and in the coming years, we expect commodity prices to remain high and consequently, consequently battery prices to remain high um, at least until 2024 before they start declining in 2025. And um, and that, that's that's where we see them going. The um the I guess the the cause of the uh, price increase is basically that demand for batteries has ramped up so rapidly, both uh, for the electric vehicle uh, industry, but also for stationary storage like utilities and and for home storage, and the uh, mineral industry and the refining and processing industries just haven't been able to keep up. Have I got that right? Yeah, absolutely. Rising demand has been one of the reasons that have put pressure on battery prices. So um, supply, both in terms of cell manufacturing capacity, but also um, for mining and refining of critical minerals, has simply not been able to catch up. So higher demand and constrained supply is, is putting pressure on, on battery prices, and that's why we see them going up. Now, we should maybe talk about uh, parts of the battery supply chain. So we start with, with critical minerals. We talked about those. But then you have the refining and processing capacity. Almost 80% of global capacity is in China. So if you want to mine lithium, say, in, in uh, North America, the odds are that you then have to send it to China to be refined and then and then bring it back. So is there a lot of capital flowing into building building out um, uh, that refining and processing capacity outside of China? Um, well, yeah, absolutely. And you make a very important point about a lot of the <clears throat> refining and mining capacity being in China. If we look at the battery value chain, we start from the critical materials, but then we go to components such as anode and cathode, and then we go to, um, to cell and pack manufacturing. In the U.S., in Europe, we've seen a lot of investment in, in cell and pack manufacturing capacity, but not as much in uh, components and even more raw materials. And because China dominates for in, in the raw material segment, both in terms of mining and refining, it's going to be quite hard for the U.S. and Europe to, to scale up. It's also important to note that Building manufacturing capacity for cells takes one to three years, about one year for, for permitting and siting, and then another one to two years for the factory to scale up to its full capacity. This timeline is a lot longer for raw materials, um, for example, refining and mining. It can take up to a decade in some cases because the permitting process can be very long and it often has opposition. Uh, so even if we start seeing more investment uh, upstream in the battery value chain, it's still going to take a long time to ramp up and, and compete with China um, in terms of the global share of capacity. Now, we've seen, in, like in Canada, for instance, the federal 
uh, finance minister, Christian Freeland, has been on record talking about how the federal government will look at streamlining that permitting process and the environmental uh, assessment process in order to bring those projects on quicker. Uh, are we seeing that uh, sort of approach in other parts of the world? Yeah, definitely. The U.S. and Canada have been trying to make the, the permitting process easier. Um, in the U.S., we've seen uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law providing funding for, for raw materials and batteries. Um, President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act, which aims to, to make the process a bit easier and unlock more funding for critical minerals and batteries. And then um, if we look at Canada, BNF also expects Canada to be a key partner, um, at least in North America, in terms of critical uh, critical minerals for batteries, um, with a lot of announcements for from raw material provide, providers building up capacity, um, and, and this is a result of a favorable policy and a lot of work that those stakeholders are putting together to make that process easier, and then also um, unlock more funds to, to make this uh, happen. Are you expecting the critical minerals and the, uh, the, the refining and processing end of the battery supply chain to be the weak link here? Uh, you know, demand for electric vehicles is soaring. Uh, we keep hearing complaints, you know, consumers are on waiting lists and and it looks like they're going to be, you know, a one or two year wait for anybody that wants an electric vehicle these days. Uh, we we know that there's a lot of demand for for batteries uh, and plants are, are being built. All of those seem so the supplies, uh, sorry, the demand is in place. Part of the battery chain uh, supply chain is organizing and 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 building plant and so on. But it seems like that critical minerals and refining process is really going to be the, the weak link here. Yes, absolutely. It is going to be the weak link. And it's going to, it's, it's one of the factors that is putting constraints both in, in terms of the output that we expect to see in um, battery manufacturing plants. Uh, because as you mentioned, now the demand is there. So it's now a matter of meeting the supply. And um, it's relatively easier to build cell manufacturing plants, but the capacity for um, for raw materials, primarily the key battery metals of uh, lithium, nickel, and cobalt, um, is is not there yet, and um, it's also not within North America and, and Europe when we speak when we speak of those of those markets. Um, right. One of the points that it's interesting to make here is that the U.S through the Inflation Reduction Act and the EV tax credits, and particularly the critical mineral and the battery component requirements, um, they're quite strict and they're really aiming to, uh, to bring that capacity, raw material capacity and battery component capacity within the U.S. Um, so I think this is going to be a main driver in, in bringing um, capacity here in, in North America and particularly the U.S. Now, despite the you know, these problems with the battery supply chain, uh, Bloomberg NEF is a, a forecasting that uh, battery prices are going to hit the $100 a kilowatt hour for battery packs in 2026. And of course, that's the threshold that's long been uh, touted at where uh, EV uh, sticker prices in the lot are the same as internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, what why do you think that prices are are going to fall that quickly? Because that's still, if you're at $151 a kilowatt hour today, that's, you know, you're dropping by a significant amount within only three or four years. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, and even though it seems relatively quick, 2026, the, price, the, point, the time point where prices fall below $100 per kilowatt hour, it's about two years later than we expected last year. And this is a result of um, higher commodities. Uh, but to answer your question um, about why we think this is going to happen, uh, it comes down to multiple factors. The first one is uh, improvements in cell chemistry, uh, whether that is um, chemistry with higher energy density, which requires lower material and lower cost as a result, higher adoption of LFP, which is 
lithium iron phosphate, a low cost chemistry that um, we've seen a lot in the stationary storage sector and also the EV sector for lower range models. Uh, and we also expect improvements in manufacturing efficiency to, to come online um, and then eventually uh, raw material prices to fall down, to fall down to, to a correction. And these are some of the main factors that we expect to see within the next couple of years, um, driving prices uh, down through the next uh, five years or so. Now, uh, Evelina, I've, I've interviewed a number of startups in that have other battery chemistries, and one that comes to mind is salient energy and their zinc ion battery. Now, this is a battery that, because it's made primarily with zinc, is it's much heavier than lithium ion. It's aimed at the uh, you know stationary storage, either at utility scale or at the residential or business uh, uh, level. But the point here is that as they as zinc ion and other chemistries scale up, they perhaps free up lithium ion. Uh, and the critical minerals to go into electric vehicles. And what role might those new chemistries play in doing that? Yeah, these are absolutely uh, key chemistries that we see in the energy transition. And as we look at different battery chemistries, we can classify them as lithium ion and non-lithium ion or emerging technologies. Uh, within, the non within the lithium ion sector, uh, LFP has been a chemistry that doesn't include um, nickel and cobalt, so it, it frees up those critical minerals for the nickel-based cathode chemistries, which um, can be more catered to the to the higher performance applications. But even beyond LFP, which is under the traditional lithium-ion umbrella, those emerging technologies like the zinc battery that you mentioned and, and, the, and the companies that you mentioned are going to play a key role. Uh, primarily for long duration storage and stationary storage applications in the near term. Um, and they can definitely free up some of the raw material um, constraints um, that are imposed by, by EVs. Um, these, these chemistries have improved safety and they're really, um, or there's really a variety of emerging technologies out there beyond lithium ion that can be suitable for different applications. Um, if you were to say which one is the best, uh, it really depends on the applications, but there's not a single answer. And there's a lot of di diversification if you look beyond lithium ion. Um, but for the near term, those technologies are going to be key for stationary storage. Now, for the side of EVs, as you also alluded to, uh, it's going to be hard to replace lithium ion, at least within this decade. Um, if, if we're looking at different chemistries for the EVs, uh, we might start talking about silicon nanodes or, or solid state technology, but it's going to be hard for those emerging technologies to, to meet the performance and the cost requirements for EVs. So um, we don't expect lithium ion tech to, to be obsolete in any time soon. Sure. Uh, my impression of the battery industry, Evelina, is, is that uh, it's a extraordinarily innovative. There's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in different chemistries, improvements to different components. Like you mentioned, silicon anodes. We're seeing. I've interviewed a couple of companies that are that are uh, that have signed deals with Mercedes-Benz and other OEMs, you know, to bring that technology into the market, you know, as early as next year. So we're, we're starting to see some of that innovation bear fruit. And it seems to me that the uh, battery industry is uh, both maturing and uh, differentiating. You know, we're, we're getting uh, chemistries like whether it's zinc ion or whatever it might be that are, are aimed at uh, niches within the industry. And you know the the technol these technologies are better suited to different types of applications. And as we scale up battery storage, it's not the story is not just about lithium ion. I think going forward, uh, it sounds to me like the story is lithium ion uh, dominates electric vehicles. It dominates maybe one or two other applications. And then we have these other chemistries, other technologies that are moving in and taking up niches in other parts of the of the market. Is that a fair way to look at this? Um, yeah, yeah, especially in for the electrical vehicle segment. For for the emerging technologies, 
uh, we definitely expect them to play a very important role, and it is going to be a more diversified market, but we expect that to happen more towards 2030. Um, a thing to note about new chemistries and, and, and new battery technology is that it's actually quite hard to, to get it right. Uh, you need to go through very long R&D development phases, and it's very hard, and it takes a long time to bring a chemistry from, from lab to a commercial scale application. Um, so it's not going to be very easy. So that's why I would just uh, um, caveat that it's, it's not going to be within the next few years, and it's going to be closer towards the end of 2030 that we're going to see some of those emerging technologies pick up. Uh, but nonetheless, there's quite a bit of investment from um, the bipartisan infrastructure law as well. We see, we see that the po policy wants to support those new technologies. And if we actually want to see them in 2030, we need to start investing more in them now um, because of that longer time frame that, that I mentioned. Um, but it's, the future is definitely very exciting and it's going to be um, very diversified and we're going to be seeing more chemistries beyond lithium ion as we are um, going through this decade. Well, Evelina, uh, here we are at the end of 2022. Uh, maybe we can close off our interview with your thoughts on what we're likely to see in 2023 in the battery space. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, in terms of prices, um, we already alluded to prices are going to remain high and even go a bit higher than we see them last year as the effects of um, COVID constraints and constraints around raw materials continue. So in terms of prices, they're likely going to be similar or slightly higher um, in terms of lithium-ion batteries. Um, another thing that uh, is important to note is potentially the impact of this looming recession on investment in new tech. Um, so it's, we're still waiting to see how the industry is going to be impacted, both in terms of um, investment, in terms of VCP investment in new tech, but also if there's a slow slowdown in growth, um, the R&D expenditure of large battery manufacturers and automakers might, might have to change. Um, so that is something that um, that is on top of my mind and obviously we're we're going to wait to see how it has evolved so it, it does seem like it's going to be a more difficult year than um, than 2022 uh, but nonetheless uh, a lot of exciting um, exciting happenings uh, within within the industry uh, they're likely going to be more announcements related to the inflation reduction act related to battery manufacturing capacity more announcements around raw materials it's something that uh, we expect companies to, to start picking up on and uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more activity on on the field so some some uh, it's not going to be an easy road but um, there's a there's a lot of activity and a lot of um, optimism from the industry well, Evelina, thank you very much for this. All the best in, uh, for in the holidays, and we'll look forward to more interviews with you in 2023. Thank you for having me. Enjoy your holidays as well.